All right, now we're looking at lab 3.2, the mass drop spark timer. Okay, so there was a little bit of trouble with this on the quizzes, so I wanted to revisit the process. Uh, obviously, COVID has kind of loused up the way we're doing things, but basically, you would have this thing, this mass over at the edge of a table. You would have the mass, you would hold it in your hand right here. The ground is down here and you have some distance here whatever it was you know some distance let's say from the bottom of the mass to the ground <clears throat> roughly on the order of one meter on the table you actually had the spark timer which we have used and there's a piece of tape running through it and attached to the mass <clears throat> and so what happened is we said go and the mass would be dropped and of course, as it drops, you would get, as you might expect, a little bit of a, a blinking light pattern here where these start to spread out more and more and more. <clears throat> Pardon the overlap, but hopefully you recognize what's going on here. It's like blink, 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 something like this. So the piece of tape attached to the mass gets instead click, 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 click. And that's what you see right here. In fact, this piece of tape is <clears throat> from an actual mass drop experiment that I did in the class. Actually, a student might've done this one. And I darkened the points, put a little pencil mark on them, uh, tried to trace them exactly. So any sort of asymmetries you see in them, that's actually from the spark timer. That's not from sloppy handwriting. Put a ruler on top, and take a picture or take a photocopy of it. So this, what you're seeing right here, is exactly this. It's just rotated. So in fact, just to give you the, the full scope of what you're looking at here, let me copy this. I'll tell you exactly what you really what would really happen. Shrink this down a bit. Ooh. All right, bring it over here. Turn it this way. You know, this is obviously blown up <clears throat> compared to the diagram there at the side. But essentially, this is what happened. As this thing is pulled, you get this pattern. And uh, for those of you who are particularly aware of what's going on, you might actually recognize that this is how the pattern would really appear. But uh, if we're thinking about the motion of it, well, whatever it is. It's, a, it's an adjustment because the mark is happening, um, trailing what's going on rather than really leading what's going on. Anyway, put that aside. So this is just what happened over here. You know, think of it this way. Here it is. There are those blinks. And so we put it on the paper and we're checking it out. Now, you had some questions. First, you all did this part where you looked at the frames. Here they were up here. And you tried to your best of your ability to come up with their distances. You were supposed to look close. And the PDF on the classroom link was much better than this. This is blurry. So you were able to really get in there and get a good look at these things. In fact, you know, you could really, this was high resolution. You could get in there. You could make a very good estimate, not to the nearest millimeter, but to the nearest tenth of a millimeter here. So this would be something like 13.5678 maybe 13.8685, depends where you chose on the dot, where you picked maybe the center of the dot. <clears throat> so your numbers all here, they should really be to the nearest hundredth of a centimeter. And you had six, and there they were, and then they gave you these graphs over here. Now, the primary graph we're concerned with is actually the distance versus time, but uh, we'll get to that in a bit. So Based on your experience with timer tapes, do you think the dot labeled zero above is at the moment the mass is released? So here's the dot at zero. Is this the moment the tape was released? Well, hopefully the answer is no, because we did this in the notes and we did this with a simulation. What you get at the moment it's released, there's like a, a blob of dots. Remember that? <clears throat> Even when the person in the front of the room did the uh, human-sized spark timer where you had somebody with a marker and the paper towel it left a whole blob in the beginning and that's the reason is 
you turn the spark timer on and it starts dotting. Dot, 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 dot. And you haven't let go yet. So the zero dot is always a mess. So this is not the zero dot. It's our zero dot here. But this is, let me rephrase it. This is not the moment the mass is released. So no. And your explanation should be you would expect to see something like this. So we actually had to pick a spot a little downstream from the actual moment of release. And that's generally the case. That moment of release point is always a mess and you can't really get good data out of it. So just by looking, what pattern do you notice up here? Well, hopefully you see the spacing, how it's changing. You should be able to answer this one in one word and then explain it. The type of motion here is very straightforward. And then you should be able to explain how you knew that. All right, based on your trend line equation. Now, lucky for you, I had pre-programmed all these to do their thing. So question three. Whoop, question three, there we go. Question three is going to take a little more development. So let's go down over here and let's talk about question three. Question three is uh, an important question. And uh, I'd like you to start to get the feeling of what you can get from these graphs. So based on my data, the distance versus time graph came out with this equation. Distance is the y-axis. Time is the x-axis. And so if I'm going to take the equation, the trend line equation, seriously, what I'm going to come up with here is y equals, bring this business up here, y equals negative 0 0.0393. Your numbers will likely be different. Plus 126x plus 492x squared. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to highlight up here these in different colors because I put this in red. Like beware, your numbers should be different. If you would have guessed all six data points to be the exact same distances as mine that's suspect right there i think the kids these days call that sus huh. stealing our old word anyway the point of this though the y-axis is distance the x-axis is time so literally what i'm doing i want you to do i want you to rewrite this as d for distance equals and put all your numbers in there put all your same numbers in there except X is the X axis, which is just time. So T for time, off color this, and T for time. Here's my equation. Now, this may not look like much to you, but this is beauty. Why is this beauty? Because we have an equation on our reference table. And the equation on our reference table is the following. Here it is. Actually, we wonder if we can screen capture that junk, too. Look, it is fantastic. Look at this little equation right here. Okay. Uh, sure, we can send it to this page. Cut it and bring it back to where we're working. Now, this little equation right here is fantastic. This equation looks whole lot like the equation above. In fact, this equation is the equation above. Let me try to convince you of that. <clears throat> the term attached to the T, let's bring this over here. The term attached to the T, in this case, that's our uh, my 126, your whatever it is. The term attached to the T is what we call our VI, our initial velocity. So down here, here's my 126. That goes with the VI. The term attached to the T squared is actually our one half A. Well, that means the term over here attached to the T squared is our one half A. There it is. And now you say, well, wait a minute, what's this business over here? Well, this equation, believe it or not, is, is a kind of a shortened version. If you look at this, this is displacement. If you look at this in some other textbooks, 
the way they actually write this equation, put it over here, is D equals initial displacement plus initial velocity times time plus one half acceleration times time squared. So in our course, because it's displacement and the way we define displacement, as always, the shortcut from start to finish, it means whenever we start our problem, our displacement is necessarily zero. But it doesn't really have to be. You realize that's kind of limiting. If we wanted to, you could really say, oh, well, what if we want to say our starting displacement is one meter above the ground, and now let's do our math. That's totally legal and physically correct. So let me reapply our colors over here. And I need a little more of that blue. And what you will see is actually, let's do this one in here, yellow. This number is our initial displacement. Okay. So what does this mean? This is awesome. This equation alone just told us everything we needed to know. How do I mean that? Well, it says, based on your equation, determine the magnitude and direction of di, vi, and a. Here we go. Here we go. Just match the equation. So come on down here. The initial is going to be over here. It's going to be negative 0 0.0393. Now, remember our units we popped in here. We popped in centimeters. This is centimeters. By the way, this is approximately zero. And it should be. Realize we're doing a trend line fit over here. And when you're doing a trend line fit, you know, there are some things that come out of the data that say, oh, wait a minute, it hits slightly below the axis. I mean, this should come out to zero because we start at wherever we start. 0 0.0393 centimeters, that's 0.3 millimeters. That's almost nothing. That's essentially zero. Don't get excited by that number. The initial velocity is 126 centimeters per second. By the way, this initial velocity, since this thing is falling down, but the direction is down. 126. You may say, well, where's my negative over here? Well, look at the data we popped in. We put positive. We put distances, not displacements. We put positive D over here. So, of course, that means by, by definition, if as it falls, we're calling that positive, well, then down is positive. So we have effectively, even not realizing it, we have effectively called down positive for this drop problem. And that's okay. We like down positive. So here, 126 centimeters per second down is our VI. You may say, well, that sounds like a lot. Put it in meters. 1.26 meters per second. It's not nothing, but it's not a lot. And that makes sense, though, related to question one. In fact, question four says, of the physical quantities in question three, which do you expect to be zero? The initial displacement should be zero, and it basically was. The initial velocity you might expect to be zero. However, because of question one, because we were avoiding that blob, it didn't come out to zero. This doesn't mean that it wasn't a drop problem. This is an important note here, and this is related to question four. I'll back it up over here. Related to, let's take a little aside, question four. This is still a drop problem. However, we didn't pay attention until the initial velocity was, you know, depending on your numbers. Mine is 126. Yours is something different, probably. So this does make it, you know, this is kind of like effectively a throwdown beginning at 126 centimeters per second downward. However, same equation. And most importantly, we should still have the same acceleration because it's the same acceleration due to gravity. So let's not get too excited like, uh-oh, everything has changed. No, it's still our drop problem. We just picked it up a little later in the game. And it shouldn't change the general idea of the acceleration. What is the acceleration? This is the this is the coolest part of all right here. This is the part I really like you to see. One half point five a is four hundred ninety two. 
You got to be real clear about this. If you just come over here and say A is 492, you messed up. What this is saying is 0.5 A equals 492 centimeters per second squared. Solve for A. Obviously, solving for A, you got to do a little math over here. Divide both sides by 0.5. Don't mess this up. This is an easy step. Divide both sides by 0.5. And you will get, depending on how you picked your numbers, you might get a fantastic acceleration. Here we go. You might get a fantastic, like I can tell from my numbers already, I'm getting a fantastic acceleration. Turn that into meter per second squared. Woo, that's clean. Two sig figs, that's gold right there. And this is real data we pulled this from. Where is that thing? This is real data we pulled this from. This is a real drop. So that's real nice. Okay. Now, uh, for your interest, by the way, look at the speed versus time graph. The speed versus time graph, which, you know, you don't need to stress it over here, but it's kind of cool. This is y equals 999x plus 116. Okay. This equation over here, I'll put it for you real quick. Because it's kind of awesome. You know, it's, uh, we're not going to lose our minds over it, but, well, maybe a little bit. Should have, like, screaming fans. Got some groupies throwing stuff up here for it. This is y equals 9, 9, 9, x plus, ooh, come on now, 116. Now, if we replace this with what it is, speed and time, speed is V, actually it's V final, equals 999T plus 116. And what's really cool about this, this is in your reference table too. In fact, I can pop it right over here. This is this equation right here. VF equals VI plus AT. Look at how cool that is. VF equals, it's out of order though. This is the AT plus the VIs over here. Look how cool that is. So what this is saying is the initial velocity was about 116 centimeters per second, which is pretty close to what we got over here. There are reasons, by the way, uh, just in terms of making this graph that more errors carry through. We'll worry about that more later on. The acceleration here, it says, is 999. That's 999 centimeter per second squared. That's 9.99 meters per second squared. That's pretty darn close. Time. So this all fits real nicely. All right, let's wrap this up. Uh, question four, we talked about five. Do your percent error based on 9.81. Sources of error. Huh. You know what? You didn't see this happen. So skip question six. I want all this right up for question three. Put the VF part in there too. That's the price you have to pay for uh, not doing source of error. <laughs> and then sketch the following graphs. D versus T, V versus T, A versus T. You don't need calculations. You can even glance over here to see what they would look like. The acceleration graph's a little funky. Um, you know what the acceleration should look like. And this is propagation of error here. With each step, solving the velocity, solving the acceleration, and solving the jerk, uh, there's more error. The errors blow up in a sense. They magnify. And that starts to make the graphs get crazy. But the first two graphs, the D and the V, look pretty awesome. Anyway, that's about that. Do it.